Hello class, this is Dr. Neil Sogi for week one of Introduction to Psychology. I was going to start off with a joke, and I figured a joke about chemistry would be good to make fun of another department, but when I started to write the joke, I found that it was too formulaic. Haha. <laughs> okay, let's get on to our class for today. No, seriously though, here's uh, my joke for the week. Why was Ivan Pavlov's hair so soft? Because he conditioned it. <laughs> Today we're learning about the learning process. And uh, learning as a process really focuses on what happens when the learning takes place. Explanations of what happens constitute learning theories. A learning theory is an attempt to describe how people and even animals, thereby helping us understand the inherently complex process of learning. Learning theories have two chief values. One is in providing us with vocabulary and a conceptual framework for interpreting the examples of learning that we observe. And as a side note there, remember that introduction to psychology, really a lot of it is simply about learning the vocabulary. Because the vocabulary provides us with the foundation for the learning. The second chief value for learn learning theories are that in suggesting where to look for solutions to practical problems, the theories don't give us solutions, but they do direct our attention to those variables that are crucial in finding solutions. The three main categories or philosophical frameworks under which learning theories fall typically are considered to be behavioral, cognitive, and constructivism. Behaviorism focuses only on the objectively observable aspects of learning. Cognitive theories look beyond behavior to explain brain-based learning. In addition, constructivism views learning as a process in which the learner actively constructs or builds new ideas or concepts. So we will look at uh, initially the behavioral theories and these fall under two broad categories, the SR theories. So that would be stimulus response theories with reinforcement. Um, so like Thorndike, the trial and error theory, B.F. Skinner, operant conditioning, and the SR or stimulus response theory without reinforcement. And that would be Pavlovian or classical conditioning. Now, response, stimulus response theory with reinforcement, um, with Thorndike, the trial and error theory of learning. Uh, now, a little bit about Thorndike. Thorndike, uh, born in 1874 through to, and he died in 1949, he was really the first American psychologist who put forward the trial and error theory of learning. So according to Thorndike, all learning takes place because of a formation of bond or a connection between the stimulus and the response. He further says that learning takes place through a process of approximation and correction. A person makes a number of trials, 
Some responses do not give satisfaction to the individual, but he goes on making further trials until he gets satisfactory responses. Thorndike conducted a number of experiments on animals to explain the process of learning. His most widely quoted experiment is with a cat placed in a puzzle box. Thorndike put a hungry cat in a puzzle box. The box had one door, which could be opened by manipulating a latch of the door. A fish was placed outside the box. The cat, being hungry, had the motivation of eating fish outside the box. However, the obstacle was the latch on the door. The cat made random movements inside the box, indicating trial and error type of behavior. Biting at the box, scratching the box, walking around, pulling and jumping. Uh, all in the effort to get out and get to the food. Now, in the course of her movements, the latch was manipulated accidentally, and the cat came out to get the food. Over a series of successive trials, the cat took shorter and shorter time, committed a less number of errors, and was in a position to manipulate the latch as soon as it was put in the box and learned the art of opening the door. Thorndike concluded that it was only after many random trials that the cat was able to hit upon the solutions. He named it as trial and error learning. An analysis of the learning behavior of the cat in the box shows that besides trial and error, the principles of goal, motivation, explanation, and reinforcement are involved in the process of learning by trial and error. Laws of learning based on trial and error learning theory, uh, Thorndike gave certain laws of learning. So there are three fundamental laws of learning. These are, number one, laws of readiness. And this law refers to the fact that learning takes place only when the learner is prepared to learn. No amount of efforts can make the child learn if the child is not ready to learn. The dictum that you can lead a horse to the pond, but you can't make him drink water unless he feels thirsty, goes very well with this law. In other words, if the child is ready to learn, he or she learns very quickly, effectively, and with greater satisfaction than if he or she is not ready to learn. In the words of Thorndike, the three stages of the law of readiness are, for a conduction unit ready to conduct, to conduct is satisfying. And for a conduction unit ready to conduct, not to conduct is annoying. And for a conduction unit not ready to conduct, to conduct is annoying. Thus, the law of readiness means mental preparation for action. It is not to force the child to learn if he is not ready. Learning failures are the result of forcing the learner to learn when he or she is not ready to learn something. So there's some educational implications of the law of readiness. So the law draws the attention of the teacher to the motivation of the child. So if we think in terms of school, the teacher must consider the psychobiological readiness of the students to ensure successful learning experiences. So in curriculum and learning experiences, they should be according to the mental level of the maturity of the child. If this is not so, 
there will be poor comprehension and the readiness may vanish. And then the second law of exercise. This law explains the role of practice in learning. According to this law, learning becomes efficient through practice or exercise. The dictum practice makes perfect goes very well with this law. This law is further split into two parts, law of use and law of disuse. The law of use means that a connection between a stimulus and response is strengthened by its occurrence, its exercise, or its use. In other words, the use of any response strengthens it. It makes it more prompt, easy, and certain. Now, regarding the law of disuse, it is said that when a modifiable connection is not made between a stimulus and response over a length of time, the strength of that connection is decreased. This means that any act that is not practiced for some time gradually decays. Anything that is not used, exercised, or practiced for a certain period tends to be forgotten or becomes weak in strength, efficiency, and promptness. So educational implications of this are that exercise occupies an important place in learning. A teacher must repeat, give sufficient drill in subject like math, like drawing, music, vocabulary, for fixing material in the minds of students. Thorndike later revised this law of exercise and accordingly it is accepted that practice does bring improvement in learning but in itself is not sufficient. Always practice must be followed with some reward or satisfaction to the learner. The learner must be motivated to learn. And then there is the law of effect. And this is important uh, law of Thorndike's, which states that when a connection between stimulus and response is accompanied by satisfying state, its strength is increased. On the other hand, when a connection is accompanied by an annoying state of affairs, its strength is reduced or weakened. The saying, nothing succeeds like success, goes very well with this law. In other words, the responses that produce satisfaction or comfort for the learner are strengthened and responses that produce annoyance or discomfort for the learner are weakened. Now, Thorndike revised this law in 1930, and according to this revision, he stated that reward strengthened the response, but punishment did not always weaken the response. Then he placed more emphasis on the reward aspect than on the punishment aspect of the law of effect. And so there's an educational implication to this, and that is that this law signifies the use of reinforcement or feedback in learning. This impl implies that learning trials must be associated with satisfying consequences. So the teacher can use rewards to strengthen certain responses and punishment to weaken others. However, the use of rewards is more desirable than the use of punishment, in, particularly in school learning. The teacher for motivating the students for learning situations can exploit the use of reward. Okay, let's go on now and explore a little bit of B.F. Skinner and operant conditioning. So what is operant conditioning? Operant conditioning, sometimes referred to as instrumental conditioning, is a method of learning that occurs through rewards and punishments for behavior. Through operant conditioning, an association is made between a behavior and a consequence for that behavior. 
The behaviorist B.F. Skinner coined the term operant conditioning, which is why it is also referred to as Skinnerian conditioning. As a behaviorist, Skinner believed that internal thoughts and motivations could not be used to explain behavior. Instead, he suggested we should look only at the external observable causes of human behavior. Skinner used the term operant to refer to an active behavior that operates upon the environment to generate consequences. In other words, Skinner's theory explained how we acquire the range of learned behaviors we exhibit each and every day. Skinner is regarded as the father of operant conditioning, but his work was based on Thorndike's law of effect. Skinner introduced a new term into the law of effect, the term reinforcement. Behavior that is reinforced tends to be repeated or strengthened. Behavior that is not reinforced tends to die out or be extinguished, to be weakened. Skinner studied operant conditioning by conducting experiments using animals, which he placed in a what we know as a Skinner box. And this was similar to Thorndike's puzzle box. The Skinner box involved placing an animal, usually a rat or a pigeon, into a sealed box with a lever that would release food when pressed. If food was released every time the rat pressed the lever, it would press it more and more because it learnt that doing so gives it food. Lever pressing is described as an operant behavior. Because it is an action that results in a consequence. In other words, it operates on the environment and changes it in some way. The food that is released as a result of the pressing the lever is known as a reinforcer because it causes the operant behavior, that is the lever pushing, to increase. Food could also be described as a conditioned stimulus because it's ca it causes an effect to occur. Now, once just a bit of a side note here that there is an important difference between a reward and a reinforcer in operant conditioning. So a reward is something which has value to the person giving the reward, but may not necessarily be of value to the person receiving the reward. A reinforcer is something which benefits the person receiving it, and so results in an increase of a certain type of behavior. Skinner identified three types of responses, or operant, that can follow behavior. There are neutral operants, and these are responses from the environment that neither increase nor decrease the probability of a behavior being repeated. There are reinforcers that are any event that strengthens or increases the behavior it follows. And there are two main kinds of reinforcers. There's positive reinforcers, are favorable events or outcomes that are presented after the behavior. In situations that reflect positive reinforcement, a response or behavior is strengthened by the addition of something, such as a praise or a direct reward. And negative reinforcement involves the removal of an unfavorable event or outcome after the display of a behavior. In these situations, a response is strengthened by the removal of something considered unpleasant. In both of these cases, reinforcement, the behavior increases. Punishment is the presentation of an adverse event or outcome that causes a decrease in the behavior it follows. Punishment weakens behavior. There's two kinds of punishment. Positive punishment, refer, sometimes referred to as punishment by application, involves presentation of an unfavorable event or outcome in order to weaken a response 
the response that follows, and negative punishment, also known as punishment by removal, occurs when a, a favorable event or outcome is removed after a behavior occurs. In both of these cases of punishment, the behavior decreases. Now, there are schedules of reinforcement um, that need to be used to under, understand how these kinds of reinforcement are used. So there's intermittent reinforcement. And that is reinforcement is given only part of the times the animal gives the desired response. Then there's continuous reinforcement. And that is reinforcement is given every time the animal gives the desired response. And then there's ratio reinforcement. And that is a predetermined proportion of responses will be reinforced. There's also fixed ratio reinforcement, and that is reinforcement is given on a regular ratio, such as every fifth time the desired behavior is produced. So there's some implications um, in this. In animal studies, Skinner found that continuous reinforcement in the early stages of learning seems to increase the rate of learning. Later, intermittent reinforcement keeps the responses going longer and it slows extinction. Skinner specifically addressed the applications of behaviorism and operant conditioning to educational practice. He believed that the goal of education was to train learners in survival skills for self and for society. The role of the teacher was to reinforce behaviors that contributed to survival skills and extinguished behaviors that did not. And so there's a long tradition of the influence of behaviorism in education. So there's some implications of the theory of operant conditioning. The first one is that teaching is the arrangement of contingencies of reinforcement which expedite learning. For effective teaching, teachers should arrange effective contingencies of reinforcement. For example, for self-learning of this student, the teacher should reinforce student behavior through a variety of incentives, such as a prize, a medal, a smile, a praise, affectionate patting on the back, or giving of higher marks. Then there's also the conditioning and classroom behavior that is influenced by behaviorism. And so during learning, the child will acquire unpleasant experiences also. This unpleasantness becomes conditioned by the teacher, subject, and the classroom. And the learner dislikes the subject and the teacher. Suitable behavioral contingencies, therefore, need to be in place as well as the atmosphere of recognition, of acceptance, of affection, and esteem, and all of that helps the child in approaching the teacher and the subject. If the sub student is not serious in study, the teacher can make use of negative reinforcement, like showing negligence, criticizing the student. But if the student is serious in study, the teacher can make use of positive reinforcement, like the prize, the medal, the praise and the smile. So, all of that. Then we can go on to the SR theory, which is the stimulus response theory without reinforcement or the Pavlovian classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov from 1849 through to 1936 is the founder of this. In classical conditioning, that is a term used to describe learning which has been acquired through experience. And one of the best known examples of classical conditioning can be found with that Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov and his experiments on dogs. In these experiments, Pavlov trained his dogs to salivate when they heard a bell ring. In order to do this, he first showed them food. 
and the sight of which caused them to salivate. Later, Pavlov would ring a bell every time he would bring the food out, until eventually he could get the dogs to salivate just by ringing the bell or without giving the dogs any food. In this very simple but really ingenious experiment, Pavlov showed how a reflex, salivation, which is a very natural bodily response, could become conditioned or modified to an external stimulus, the bell, thereby creating a conditioned response. So we can gain a better understanding of classical conditioning by looking at a, the various components involved in his experiments. We have the unconditioned stimulus, the UCS, the conditioned stimulus, the CS, the unconditioned reflex or response, the UCR, and the conditioned reflex or response, the CR. So just to sum up a little bit what we've covered in this class. Uh, the theories of learning uh, we've looked at primarily behaviorism within this lecture and we've looked at instrumental and operant conditioning of B.F. Skinner and it mentioned the two types of responses the relevance of reinforcement as well as punishment to students learning and we've also looked a little bit at the implications of the theory of educational settings for this type of learning. We've looked at Thorndike's theory, emphasizing that the fundamental of learning is the association between sense impressions and impulses to the action, so the stimuli and responses. And the theory here stresses readiness. Uh, exercises and effect as the conditions for learning. And then finally, classical conditioning theory was formulated by Ivan Pavlov. And the basic tenet of the theory is that behavior of an organism can be manipulated using some environmental factor. The key relevance of this theory to learning is that it emphasizes the practice of one task before moving on to another and encourages the use of motivation for effective learning. And that's it for our lecture this week. Take care. Bye-bye. No, seriously though. Here's um, my joke for the week. Why was Ivan Pavlov's hair so soft? Because he conditioned it. <laughs> See, now you get the joke. See you next week.